Good evening, everyone. I'm Carrie Coogan. I'm Deputy Director of Community Engagement and Public Affairs for the Library. Thank you all so much for being here tonight for this very special evening. Before we begin, I have a quick reminder. If you haven't already, please pick up one of our calendars. This is our new October calendar. It's filled with all kinds of programs, services, um, and our current exhibitions that are um, up at our central location downtown. We have two art galleries downtown, and there's all kinds of information here, so we hope that you will pick this up. There's a lot going on, and there's honestly something for everybody in here, so please pick this up. Also, um, we also provide a rundown of our events uh, through an email blast, and you can sign up for an email, a weekly email, instead of uh, this calendar if you'd like, and there's information in that calendar on how you can do that. So tonight, we are honored to bring the leading poets in Missouri and Kansas, the poet laureates of each state for readings and a conversation about their work, the importance of poetry, what their roles as poet laureates entail, and what they've encountered as they've traveled our states. Mary Frances Wagner from Independence is Missouri's sixth poet laureate, serving from 2021 through next June. She's a teacher at Raytown High School and the University of Missouri, Kansas City for 30 years. She's also the author of 10 collections of poetry. She's also co-editor of the I-70 Review, served as the co-editor of the New Letters Review of Books, and sits on, sit, currently sits on the board as president of the directors of the, Lord, excuse me. She is the president of the board of directors of the Writer's Place. Waskar Medina, who lives in Lawrence, became the first Latino Poet Laureate of Kansas in 2019. He has published two poetry collections and serves as literary editor for 785 Magazine. Some of you may have heard of that. He's the staff editor for South Broadway Press and op-ed writer for the Kansas Reflector. He's winner of Arts Connect's 2018 Artie Award for Literary Art. The conversation tonight is led by the library's own staff writer and editor, Ann Knigendorf, who herself is the author of two nonfiction books. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, both of our poet laureates will have their books on sale afterwards outside as you exit. Uh, but just a word of caution, um, we won't be able to take credit cards this evening, but we can take PayPal and or cash and check. So just keep that in mind. And then we're all, we will also take time for questions. So we ask those of you that are here tonight to use the microphones that will be placed down in the front. And we are also live streaming to all of our friends at home tonight, welcome. And please submit your questions in the chat. Again, thank you all for being with us tonight and please join me in welcoming Mary Frances Wagner, Waskar Medina, and Ann Knigendorf. Hello. Good evening. I'm so glad you're all here. Um, that was a very short introduction for each of you, so I'm hoping that you'll give everybody just a little bit more um, about, about yourselves, um, your background, and, and what you're doing now. Mary Frances? Um, okay, I'm not quite sure what she did say, because I couldn't <laughs> okay. hear her. It was just what you're doing, so your what publications. Okay, yeah, so well, I mean, if you could tell me a little bit, you know, how you're involved in the, the literary community in Kansas City, for instance. Okay, um, well, I am president of the Writer's Place, and I uh, sponsor readings, I set up readings, I sponsor specific events, uh, members parties, uh, book signings, I give talks, keynotes across the state, I've uh, done radio shows, uh, workshops, readings, um, festivals, uh, I've done... You, you do it all. I do it all. <laughs> okay, and well, I have pretty much all my life. That's great, that's amazing. One of the things I really like to do is combine the arts, uh, where we bring together music, dance, poetry, visual art, um, and make that all kind of come together in either like a gallery exhibit or a live improvisational performance. That sounds like we could talk about all of that for the next hour. 
Yes, yes. I've done it with uh, the Fringe Festival. I've done it uh, with River Cow Orchestra at Westport Coffee House Theater. We've done it at many galleries um, across the city. You know, yeah, I could talk about that for <laughs> the whole time, really. That's a new program. Yes. <laughs> okay, Waskar, how about you? Thank you for doing all that, Mary Frances. Let me begin <laughs> by saying that. She does do a lot. Um, <laughs> I serve as the Poet Laureate of Kansas right now, and uh, what I'm doing is traveling the state, um, trying to bring poetry to places where it's normally not accessible. Um, it matters to me to, to share poetry with all ages, all demographics, and, and to try to get people to see it as a, a, a tool to use in your day-to-day -day lives, so a form of communication that's, that's accessible to everyone to share uh, collaboratively. That's, that's been my mission as Poet Laureate of Kansas, but the other things I do, uh, they talked earlier about me being an op-ed writer for the Kansas Reflector. I also write uh, for the Kansas um, 75 magazine, which is only in Northeast Kansas. It's not quite into Kansas City. Um, maybe one day, you know, we'll get out here. Um, we're close to our 100th issue, so I've been writing for them for a long time. For about six years now, I've been writing reviews uh, for about poets who are in the area, but also poets who don't get attention in our area, some national poets as well. I write uh, reviews about their work, share their work, so uh, they can have access to work that no one would bring to them in our area. I also sit on a board in Topeka, which is the Arts Connect. It's a local art agency. I think it's important that poetry is always at the table when there's conversations about art. Sometimes we get overlooked in those conversations and, and the roles that we can play. Um, I also work with Mid-America Art Alliance, which is based out of Kansas City as well, uh, doing uh, artist uh, services programming through Artist Inc. It's one of the programs where we do artist development and professional training for artists. Um, and I want more, more writers at those, those convenings and, and doing work as well uh, to get them to be mid-career writers as well. And I also sit on National Council on the Arts right now. It's something else I'm doing, so I'm representing poetry on a national level at the moment. Um, and I'm, I have programs too <laughs> that I've been doing for quite a while. So, so much. Yes. Um, so you mentioned poets often getting overlooked, um, but what's funny about that is that Kansas City has a really vibrant poetry community. Um, pretty much any demographic has a strong network of poets in Kansas City, which is amazing. And uh, so I wonder, you know, how did you each come to poetry? Because it is something that's very powerful but often overlooked in, in the area, or maybe just in general. Um, but, but everybody who is in poetry seems to have a story about how they came to poetry. So what are yours, Mary Frances? Uh, mine began with my mother, uh, who wrote little poems, and she put them in our lunch boxes. She put them in our overnight bags, my brother's duffel bag, my father's camping gear, uh, on our pillows at night. I mean, you, they were just like we had them all the time. And my father wrote little poems. Um, I call them little poems because they were short, and they didn't really know a whole lot about poetry. They just loved it. And my father wrote little poems for my mother for Valentine's Day and, and um, her birthday. My grandfather uh, recited poems to me, both in Italian and in English, and he sometimes sang them on his mandolin. And my father had a whole bunch of poems memorized, which he would recite to me when we'd drive around at night to go get ice cream when I was a kid. And so that sort of planted the seed, and then I started getting interested in writing it, and uh, thought, well, I better learn some more about it. And so I started taking classes, and although my bachelor's is focused in um, literature, my master's focused in creative writing. And, and I just kept going, and um, it's you know, been a part of my life always, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know when I wasn't writing poetry. Or hearing it. Or hearing it, that's right. I have attended so many readings. I have many, many poet friends who are wonderful writers and uh, I love their work. I love to read it. Um, I love to hear it. Um, that's kind of where it all began. And It's just always been part of your life. Always part of my life. Waskar, how about you? Poetry's been my, my first love since I was very young. I don't have the relationship with poetry with my family. It was something I came to on my own. Poetry became the first, the first friend. Uh, my father's in the military. We moved around quite a bit growing up. 
So I, I kind of leaned into books a little more, and poetry were the easy books to read. Um, a little harder to understand, but easy to feel. So I was able to have conversations with people who weren't around, but I could bring them with me to the next town we moved to. So poetry has always uh, provided a, a relationship and a conversation that I could have. So I've had that relationship since I was 12. You know, I grew up reading Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The collected works of poets is how I, I, I introduced myself to poetry, because I feel like all of this is everything they've written that had some kind of emotional attachment to it. I was like, OK, well, this is who they are, you know, at least as a poet. You know, younger, you're thinking, this is who they are. But as a poet, that's, that, that's who they were. So I built relationships with, with poets so I could travel with them. And then I became a traveling poet for 10 years. I just went from event to event, just hawking books, and uh, did some slam poetry along the way. So my relationship with poetry has been the way I've gotten into social circles most of my life, or the way I've avoided social circles most of my life. So. <laughs> Well, it's a really big deal to have both of you on the stage together. I don't know if that's happened. Um, has it? Have you have appeared anywhere together? Not I mean, yet. here. I mean, and we don't want to do any kind of border war thing, right? It's no. tempting. It's very tempting to try to pit you against each other today. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of what's a really divisive poetry issue I could bring up. So it's Kansas against Missouri, but, but I won't do that. Um, but I do want to know um, how it was that you, you moved from just loving poetry to ending up your state's poet laureates. I mean, that's amazing. How, Mary Frances, what was your journey? How did you get this position? Well, uh, I was nominated for it, and then someone from the State Department called me and said, if the governor selected me, would I be willing to serve? And um, I said yes, and then they said, okay, this is the paperwork we need you to fill out. So I filled that out, sent it to them, and then the next thing I knew, I got a phone call from the governor's office. So. Uh, it, that was, it was really, I did almost nothing. Uh, <laughs> well, you wrote a lot of poetry. Well, of course, you know. Good poetry. Uh, you, I thought you meant just in the selection. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah, over the year, I, I have quite a track record of uh, books and readings and, uh, you know, all the things that I have done. And I think, you know, poet, they look at that the poet laureate is able to communicate with people in the state that has that they have some sort of experience with teaching and communicating to people who don't write poetry and to people who do. Um, so they do look at all of that. I mean, I had to send them an, an involved resume. That was part of it. And it, you had to list all of the publications and all the things you had done and um, awards and community service and all of those things were part of it, of the final uh, weighing in. OK, and how did it work in Kansas? It was a bit rigorous. Rigorous? <laughs> it was more rigorous. rigorous than that? It was, it was rigorous. It was, OK. Th there isn't a nomination process for, for us in, in Kansas. The, you have to apply for the position. Anyone can apply for the position. So um, I decided to throw my name in the hat, and I was not expecting to get the position, to be quite honest with you, my, my first time applying. Uh, you have to provide uh, ten, your, your 10 poems. So you hope you, your 10 best poems. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm thinking. If, if you don't have 10 good poems, then you know, maybe the position's not for you yet. Um, so I, I gave him my 10 best at that, that moment. And there's a, a writer's CV you have to share, uh, letters of recommendation as well. So it's about a 20, 24, 26 page application process. Where you count everything that you put together for them to look over. And there's a group of individuals that uh, pick two finalists. And then you go into a room and uh, you have to share your work, what your presentation may be during your term as Poet Laureate, and that's how I got the, the position. And each state doesn't have a Poet Laureate, is that right? Yeah, there are some states that do not have any. Yeah, and, and it seems like, I, mean, I want to say that this should be a position that every state has, right? Because we have the state flower, we have state trees, state bugs. I mean, we have state just about everything, don't we? Yeah, and surprisingly, one of the states that doesn't have one is one that you would think would, and that's Massachusetts. Massachusetts, because really? Because it's you know, such an intelligent state, and uh, it's surprising. Huh. But, you know, to follow up on, on what Oscar said, I did have to send them a lot of poems, and the person who nominated me 
also got the recommendations. You have to have the recommendations too. So he had people write the recommendations. And um, then, after all this was done, then he said, by the way, uh, so yeah, it's a lot the same except we didn't have to, um, didn't have to sit in a room with anybody. That was interesting. That was an interesting process. Yeah. Well, so I wonder if once you accepted the positions, if the expectations were similar, if they paid you something similar, like how did that work between Kansas and Missouri? A big difference between Kansas and Missouri. Really? Yeah, in Missouri you only get $2,500 honorarium. For the entire three each years? Year. Oh, each, each year. And okay. we only do two years. Two years, okay. We, we typically do a, a two year, but the the Poet Laureateship was with Humanities Kansas, which was a, a nonprofit organization. And then it switched over this past year to the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission. So the way that we were paid changed. We, we, we built a contract. Uh, there's a, a, a yearly stipend, um, 1000 a month plus travel is the, the arrangement that we have. So um, that allows me to travel uh, across the state and, and do the work. And, and you know, with the title, you also get honorariums and, and opportunities to, to go to events um, that you normally wouldn't have gotten without the title. So um, I'm, there's other ways to receive also funding you know, along, along the way. But we, we do receive a considerable amount of money. It, it's a big difference, I believe. Yeah. It then what's expected of you then for, I mean, we don't want it to sound like you're, you're doing this just because of, uh, you know, how much you do depends on how much you're paid or anything like that because anybody who's in poetry does it for the love of the poetry. Right. As it, probably everybody in this room could agree because I imagine these are mostly poetry lovers we have in the audience tonight. But what were the expectations with what they gave you? The requirements uh, were one, I had to write a poem about Missouri. And You'll read that later, is that right? Okay, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, you had to deliver it at the Capitol. And because of COVID, you know, everything got really messed up because of COVID in terms of traveling and everything. And they didn't have the a normal event that they usually have where they bring the new poet laureate to the Capitol and they have a big ceremony. There, They didn't do any of that. Instead, I came... Uh, for the bicentennial and read the poem um, outside. We were all outside. And, um, and that's, you know, so I didn't have any of the uh, ceremony that went with it. Or, and they sent me my, my documents in the mail and I had to have them notarized myself. But that's COVID, you know, it, it isn't normally like that. Uh, the other thing I had to do was be involved in the Poetry Out Loud program at the state level. And Is that something everybody should already know about, the Poetry Out Loud? Uh, I mean, do people know about know. Poetry Out you Loud? Poetry Out Loud I don't think I know about it. No, I see some heads. No, they don't. Okay, well, Poetry Out Loud is uh, open to high school students, and what they do is select uh, a poem from a group of poems submitted, about 100 poems, and they um, memorize them and they perform them. And then uh, judges uh, per judge their performance, their accuracy, everything has to be uh, perfect and you, or you lose points for um, even a one word off. And then um, they compete at a high school level and then at uh, area level, and then a citywide level, then a regional level, and then a state level. And then the winner of that um, become, gets a, an honorarium, I'm not sure what it is, and some other uh, lovely little extras, and they perform it at the state. But last year we didn't perform it at the state, didn't perform at the state, we did it on Zoom. And, uh, but it was still a really nice ceremony and a, a event. And then um, the other thing is just to promote poetry throughout the state uh, as much as you can. You know, you can do it with readings, with workshops, uh, whatever people ask you to do, you can make decisions about that. You know, I've judged quite a few contests. 
Um, I've given a lot of workshops on Zoom from never leaving my computer, um, but I have made a, you know, a few um, adventures out there as well. And but I want to hear about those in a minute. That's I about think it's all, all we're here are. for the adventure, right? I know I'm here for the poetry adventures. Um, Waskar, what was expected of you in Kansas? Different when we change. The reason I got a third year, I'm in my third year, is typically two. The next poet laureate will be four years. Uh, this is an arrangement that we, we've, we've made with the state uh, for the position. Ten, ten events is what they, the expectation is of the poet laureate of Kansas. Um, I, in the last three years, I did um, over 100 um, readings, open mics, and workshops. Um, I did over 50 commission works in the three years I've been poet laureate, so I've been quite busy. Uh, like, like Mary, I was also doing virtual for a while, so I, was, uh, I call myself the first virtual poet laureate of Kansas. Yes. Um, and hopefully the last, <laughs> you know, because um, it's nice to be with people again. Yeah. Yeah, well, Karen, Karen Crago also was a COVID poet. We call ourselves the COVID poet laureates. Poets laureate. Yes, poets laureate. There we go. Purple Mountain's majesty, right? Yes. <laughs> Same thing. Okay, so, so then as you embarked on being your state's poet laureate, what, what were you thinking? Did you, I mean, you mentioned that you want to spread poetry across the state, but where, where do you even begin with that? Because so many people, I think, kind of balk at poetry, right? I mean, for it whatever is. reason, there's like this mental block around poetry. Yes, do you, that's Have true. you figured any of that out? Like, what's happening with that? Why do people say, whoa, poetry, what? <laughs> like I, it's, I, I have a theory. You've got something? And okay, I, good. I, I really think when people initially experience poetry, it's, it's, it's in a classroom setting, and they're being graded for it. Um, the people who don't, are the ones who experience it at home and they tend to have a better relationship with poetry uh, than other individuals uh, who, you know, you gotta memorize this poem or you're gonna get uh, a, a B if you don't or a C, you know, in your classroom or, or what does this, poet, this poem mean rather than how does this poem make you feel. I think it's a big difference in the way that people uh, communicate and have talked about poetry. I think that's probably one of the other factors as well. People are like, oh, I don't understand this. Yes, but how does it make you feel? I think if we had conversation about poetry that way, more people would be open to it. Yeah, as, as a person who has taught, uh, I have had students, have, when we've gotten to poetry, it's always been, no, not poetry, I never get it. And my answer to that is always, let me have an opportunity to change it. And the goal always is not to do what he has said that teachers have done because that is what a lot of teachers do because they don't know how to do it any other way. Like they turn it into math, kind of. Yeah. I mean, no like, offense to math. Let's beat this thing up until we figure out what it means. And uh, there's no opportunity for it to have various meanings. And, you know, and, you know trying to bring poems to uh, people that they can understand and that they can like and can engage with. And then as they get a taste of it and like it, then you can keep taking them higher until they can understand harder poems. And, um, and um, I think one of my goals, I've had two major goals, and one of those goals has been to put poetry in the hands of people who do not read it do not think they like it and want to run away. And um, so I've had several ways that I've tried to do that, but um, I think I've made some progress in that regard. But one of the most interesting things I've found out is how many people in Missouri write poetry. We have so many poets and I'm just learning who some of them are. And you know, it's a big state uh, and um, it's amazing. Have you found that too, that there are a lot of people who write poetry? A lot of people write poetry. Uh, and I work with middle schoolers, high schoolers, people out of school, in libraries, and also I go to universities and also do workshops and readings. And a lot of my process has been collaborative. But what I've realized is that people are asking permission you know, to express themselves, uh, especially as, as, as a youth. Um, they don't want to be criticized early in, in the practice of poetry or, or writing poetry or experiencing poetry. So being able to 
to meet them and be like, hey, rather than me sitting here and just read poetry to you, how about let's just write some together? Let's just start there. Let's, let's use this as a space of creative expression together that's collaborative. So there's some equity in that space, and I, I think that removes some of the, the mystery behind poetry that sometimes exists. And I think sometimes as poets, we don't do a good job of, of promoting poetry outside of our community. You know, we can get really siloed with um, what it is to be a poet, and I, I think anyone has the capacity to be a poet, and we decide what kind of poetry we like because it is an art form, it's also subjective. Um, but there are a lot of poets in Kansas. I, I spent a lot of time reviewing, interviewing, because I had a show for a while called Kansas is Lit during the pandemic, and I interviewed poets during that time. And you see, even in Topeka alone, there were like 12 poets who were published and writing on a, on a regional, local, and a national level. You know, it's, they're, they're out there. We just, we need to champion those poets. I think it's very important that we champion other poets, not just ourselves. So, and that was, that was part of my process. And I think that's why I got selected as poet laureate, because I don't have the academic background, but I've been engaged with poetry on, on a lot of ways for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I would agree with everything you just said. And then, you know, in terms of Kansas and Missouri, you know, can Kansas and Missouri, uh, Kansas City and is right on the border there, so many of our friends are Missourians, and many of them are Kansans. And it, it, so there really, to me, is, you know, there's no war. <laughs> there's no war, it's just love. He's there saying. doesn't have right. to be a war. <laughs> it just would have been sort of funny to make a poetry war. But I might be alone in thinking that would be funny, so I apologize. <laughs> um, it's just poetry support. Poetry support. And it sounds like something else that's really important in both of the, I mean, what you both said was that people need a point of entry, right? So they need something where they can say, oh, okay, well, I relate with that, or I know how to do that. And so how did you bring that out for people? I mean, especially people who are reluctant to engage with poetry. How did you find points of entry for them? Do you mean as in uh, writing it or as in... It, Reading maybe? or writing it. Well, okay, I can tell you about my first project then because that's hey, how good. That, that I did that. Um, and I thought you only had one project each as Poets Laureate, but you have multiple projects? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we do lots of things. It sounds like you do lots of things. Is this not cute? Is that uh, a tiny little book? This is a tiny book. And um, it opens up, and it has one poem. And my other goal was to promote Missouri poets. So uh, I've made 18 different ones of these. 18 different Missouri poets are represented. And then the goal, everyone that has been has a tiny book, received a quantity of them, and their job was to hand them out to people that were not writers. So your grocer, the mailman, your neighbor, uh, I sometimes used to drop them in people's sacks, uh, give them to your dentist, your doctor, and introduce them to these little poems. and. And they always are kind of like, oh, this is so cute. And then they sort of get into it. Well, this is, oh, well, I get this. And, uh, and so you're moving it around. And I've told them, if you like it and you want to keep it, then keep it. If you don't want to keep it, don't throw it away. Just give it to someone else who doesn't write or read poetry. And let's keep passing them around the state so that they get into the hands of hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands and thousands of people. So did you have to be really careful about which poems you selected for the tiny books? I, did, I didn't select them. I let okay. the poets send me the poem they wanted to use, um, but I told them it had to be accessible to a, a universal audience, a mainstream universal audience. So no elliptical poetry, no difficult poetry. It had to be accessible. Okay. And they all honored that. They're wonderful poems, all of them that I received. That's so exciting. I hope that worked. Yeah. The other, a second project I did to reach those people was um, podcasts. I made 10 podcasts with 10 yet more Missouri poets. And um, the poets involved in this one 
uh, are Joe Benevento. They're, they represent all areas of the state, uh, different diversity, uh, different ages, uh, you know, just a wide, diverse group. Uh, Stan Banks, Ruth Williams, Courtney Faye Taylor, Carl Phillips, Marjorie Stelmach, Andres Rodriguez, David Baker, Mark McKee, and Katherine Anderson. And each one of these podcasts is like 10 to 20 minutes long. And each poet answers two questions about the craft of writing. They give a prompt to write a poem, and then they read two uh, of his or her own poems. And then um, we uploaded these on Anchor, Spotify, and uh, you can also get them on um, Apple, and you can get them, you can even Google them and get them on your computer. And it's called The Literary State. And the hope was that people would listen to them on their way home from work, that they would uh, listen to them at the table with a pen and write while they're cooking, and that teachers and professors would play them for their students and have their students uh, respond in writing. And I think these have been pretty uh, successful too. A lot of uh, people have told me that they've been downloading them, listening to them, and several teachers have said I'm using them in my classroom, so. So it's working, that's exciting. Yeah. So Waskar, how did you make it accessible to read and write? And just less intimidating. I, I went to, to classrooms, I reached out. Uh, the original uh, Poet Laureate program for the state of Kansas was um, geared towards individuals to meet at libraries and then they had to be out of school. I was like, but what about the kids? So I would go into a community and I'd go to a classroom and we'd write some really easy poems, like uh, an Afro, we'll, we'll start with the first line. And you know, one of the poems is, you know, a color of my day. And then we will we'll tell me uh, something about this color, brown, yellow, and red, and blue, and green, um, and attach it to a, a memory. You know, so we started very simple with, with giving them some prompts so they can experience poetry and see that they can express themselves through poetry in their day. This is at like the, the middle school level. You know, at the high school level, we get into conversations about uh, the different voices that people have in poetry, and I share poetry from other poets and my poetry. And then when I got to the university level, we're, we're writing poetry you know, with particular ideas and prompts. So it's, you know, it's, it's a scaled approach. I think you've got to meet people where they're at when it comes to poetry. And, and what's really interesting is those, those workshops for the, the middle schoolers and younger, um, sometimes the parents would participate if, if we were doing it at a library, if not just at school. And um, they also wrote poems with their kids, so it was a shared experience between the parents and the kids. So now, now they were having shared experiences like you were you know, with, with your parents' uh, poetry. Not in Italian, but they were having uh, <laughs> yeah. experiences with poetry. Yeah, ditto to everything you said. That's exactly, I, you know, workshops at all levels like that. Yeah. Well, when, when we spread poetry like that and we get more and more people interested, what's the effect of that? I mean, why do we want that to happen? I, oh, go ahead, Mary, I'm sorry. Well, um, you mean why do I think poetry is important? Is sure, kind of, why? why? Uh, well, because at heart, poetry touches the human spirit. Um, it enables us, uh, as we to read it, to find ourselves, uh, to bring our own story to a poem, to say, yes, somebody else has felt like I have felt. Um, and as the writer, it gives you the opportunity to express something that is meaningful to you and communicate with the world uh, in multiple ways uh, through, a, through poetry. And um, I think literature does that in general, but poetry in particular. I would have to second that poetry in particular does that. Uh, I like to say that uh, poetry allows you to share hard truths in soft ways. So you can have difficult conversations through poetry. Um, some of the work that I've done has been with the Kansas Office of Victims Assistance. With, with what, I'm sorry. The Kansas Office of Victims Assistance. Oh, okay. um, and we did a remembrance ceremony every year at four locations for individuals who've lost family members to violent crime. So I've, I've been commissioned to do that yearly. Um, another project that I did that has a hard truth attached to it is the one that I've been doing for the last month, which uh, I got a grant from the Academy of American Poets that was funded through the Mellon Foundation. And I was able to travel the state and expand a program called Word Save Lives across the state of Kansas. Um, and it's geared towards a, 
we believe that uh, communication through art saves lives, and we're trying to do suicide prevention, but um, right before people reach that threshold, so we want people to live glad, glad lives, is what we like to say. Lives are happy to live, so we don't have to enter into a clinical space when it comes to these feelings that we're not sharing because silence is deadly. And the original event took place in 2014 with Marsha Epstein, LMSW, in Lawrence, Kansas, and I've expanded it to 11 locations thus far uh, this past month. So it started during World Suicide Prevention Awareness Month on September um, day, on September 10th, and I've been able to do it weekly for the last couple of weeks across the state. So being able to go into communities and, and let people talk, to share whatever art form, not just poetry, but um, I'm bringing poetry. Some people brought music, dancing, improv, theater, dance. Um, there were a lot of ways that they found to express themselves through something that was very difficult to share. But I believe poetry is the easiest way to do so. I think it is to, um, you can get down to the essence of something really quickly and, and, and poetry is usually felt before it's understood. So it's a good entry point uh, to those hard conversations. So, so is this working? Like, do you see across the state, are you, do you feel like these projects that you've done and the traveling that you've done and the people you've managed to speak to, do you feel like you are making poetry come alive in your state and, and taking it to more people? Do you feel like you're succeeding, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, well, I've been doing this all my life, so it's not uh -huh. like additional. But yeah, I definitely think it does. I see it. I see how it connects with kids. I see how it helps kids get over some things, particularly kids at risk um, in very dire situations. Uh, but also with people who aren't very good at expressing themselves, find a way to talk about like he said, difficult things. And, um, and you, you can see people light up when, when they accomplish something that they wanted to accomplish and somebody else gets it. And uh, then it's like they've communicated something. Um, and I see it at all levels. And it, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. That it makes it great for us as the people who got them there. Rewarding. It's very rewarding. It, okay, so you've felt all that too? I, I felt that in every community I went to um, at, at all ages, seeing people empowered to share my work because it's similar to something they're feeling. You know, making the work accessible so, so someone can use your words to empower themselves and to share it themselves on a stage in front of an audience. You know, um, the last book was about being second generation immigrant and, you know, sometimes feeling uh, displaced or not at home. So uh, sharing my particular book across the state kind of um, also gave some representation as the first Latino poet laureate of the state of Kansas that we can also hold positions of leadership in the arts as well. Um, I think that was very important to do. So that visibility was important to me. And I, I had a video sent to me with a middle schooler the other day reading my poem at their Hispanic Heritage uh, Day celebration. You know, just proud. I'm a Mexican American and just, just reading it with, with, with all the love and, 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 and pride that, that I expect that I expected in, in that experience for someone else. So writing work that's accessible is really important to me. And I've, I believe I've done that to a degree, but I also believe I've, I've raised the visibility of the Poet Laureate position in the state of Kansas. We, we are um, being recognized nationally now, you know, especially with, with the grant that, that we recently received. Um, I think it's in, people see Kansas is doing poetry on a very high level. Um, and for a while, you know, there's always this conversation about us being a flyover state, but there's great writers in Kansas as well. And for, for a very long time, we've had to go to Kansas City to get some attention. And um, I, I think it's, I think we can champion ourselves and, and, and increase the literary ecosystem that exists in Kansas. Now, I'd like you to read in a minute, but before we get to that and um, questions from the audience, um, I wonder if you could each tell me something that really surprised you. Like, was there something that you, you know, you were going around the state or you were meeting with people and after a while you just thought, oh, wow, I had no idea. Yes, I, I have a wonderful one. Um, I uh, posted on Facebook the pictures of some of the little tiny books. And one of my former students, who was a math major, a calculus engineer today, um, wrote back to me and he said, can you send me some of those little books? I just love those. And then he told me that 
Uh, he lived next door to Diana Moxon, who is kind of um, uh, does a program similar to what you do with KCR. It's like Columbia's version of NPR. And, um, and she lived next door to a woman who has a tiny gallery. And the tiny gallery is like, you know, those little books that people put in little tiny libraries and outside, and then you can go take a book or put a book in. This is art. And she puts little art pieces in, and then you can take a little art piece out. And so she said, I want to put the little tiny books in there. And so she got a big bowl, and she put all of the ones that I sent into this bowl, and they, people, as they went by, picked one up, and they responded to it artistically. So they carried it into another medium, which is, I love that. So then uh, Nick, who was the student, sent me one of the ones that he did to one of my poems and a couple of others that they had responded to. And I thought, this is just exactly what you want to happen. That's this so kind fun. Of thing. That's great. And none of them are poets and none of them write poetry, but they responded to it. That's what you want is the response. Yes, That's yes. so great. Well, Oscar, how about you? What surprised you? How open people were to having those difficult conversations. Uh, the overall view is that we're quite divided and, and polarized, but when you enter a community of vulnerability and authenticity um, and, and humility, people are willing to listen and, and share their stories as well. And I think that bridge building that poetry uh, creates is, is something I saw just over and over again. It did not matter what community I went into, it happened everywhere. Um, so that's, I, at first I was a little hesitant, you know, sharing the type of work that I was sharing. Um, some people can say it's, it's, it's political, and, and it's not. It's, it's my life story and, and the story of my friends. It's just been politicized. Uh, so going into communities and people being open to my story, I, I think it's something that I, I was constantly surprised by because people don't, you don't know how people are going to react when you're sharing things uh, of that nature. So. So something, you have a lot in common as poets, but one thing is that you know, your grandparents came from Italy, right? And your parents spoke Italian right. as their first language. And then your parents are from Puerto Rico and Panama, right? right. And so, um, I mean, there's the generation difference. But other than that, it seems like that's really influenced your work. I mean, there were a lot of things in Solving for X. That's her newest um, collection um, that you, you're really talking about, exactly that. And then it, you, in, in a Mango Grows in Kansas, you have all your poems in both English and Spanish. So it very much informs your work. But you know, I wonder where the two of you kind of meet on that and how that makes your work similar and different. Well, you can't, I mean, you're, you it's who can't you are. escape who you are. Right. I mean, that's right. You're going to write about what you know and what you've experienced, what you've lived. And um, that was always an influence in my family, even though my parents only spoke Italian to their parents, and one of my grandmothers and never learned English, they never taught Italian to us because they spoke uh, a dialect that was not, uh, they immigrated before um, Mussolini standardized English, I mean, Italian. And so the, all over uh, Italy, they spoke 300 different dialects and some of them couldn't even understand each other. So they said, if we taught you this, you'll be speaking a language no one else understands except us. So they wanted us to be American, to feel American, to be patriotic, to love being American, but they wanted those roots of Italian to stay part of us. So we honored traditions, we, you know, the, you know Christmas came and my mother was making sfingi and my father was making anisette and Biscotti at weddings and, you know, pasta on Sunday. You know, there were traditions that lived with us. And my father, when I started writing poetry, he said, you need to preserve your heritage. Uh, you need to write about your people. And so my, um, all, I have, all of my books have theme in them with family poems. And the the last book before Solving for X, The Immigrant's New Camera, is a collection of all of my family poems. And they do reflect um, that her Italian heritage. The, the, the second book I wrote was really about my experience being in the United States. It, 
you're the first to be the Latino poet laureate of Kansas, so all of a sudden people may have, I don't, I'm not saying everyone did, uh, assume that now you're the voice for a group of people, but we're not monolithic, we're all very different. I was just writing about my particular experience, um, and my experience is about isolation and displacement and, and searching for a home, a place to belong to, which I found in, in the Kansas. I've lived here over half my life. But I had to write about what, what, how I got to Kansas, you know, and what the experience has been while I'm in Kansas. Because I think it's an experience that a lot of people have, and I think it's, a, it's an American experience you know, that, that needs to be written about um, from, from a different lens than it's traditionally written. So I, I really thought deeply about what my, my immigrant experience, which some may consider not to be an immigrant experience. My father has citizenship. My mother didn't get her citizenship until 2009 because she's from Panama. So I wrote about that, and I wrote about the conversations I've had with my friends who are dreamers who come from other countries as well. So it was, it was a collective voice in my work. And it, that was very important because I think the, the, the story of, of, of immigration in the United States, it's a collective story. Um, so being able to add my story to that uh, was really important to me. And having a platform to do so was also important to me. Mary Francis, would you read a, a couple of short ones? And then we'll have Waskar read a longer one. And then Mary Francis, you can take us out at the end with a couple more short ones. OK. Um. I thought uh, I would start with a poem, since I've been talking about heritage. Uh, I would read a, this is a poem I often read because it sort of sets this stage for what I've you know, done all along. And this is a, I, I was very lucky to have, my father was from a family of 13 kids, and um, six of, four of my aunts were born in Italy. And, he had six sisters and um, four brothers, and then the, a couple of the children died in infancy. So, uh, but 11 of them grew up to be adults. And my aunts were great storytellers, so they gave me material. Um, and that, and I uh, recorded a lot of what they, their stories, and I wrote down a lot of their stories. And then I started writing poems. And this is one of them. Um, they grew up in the North End where the Italians lived, and they didn't have much. And this is the poem that is the title poem for the um, family collection. It's called The Immigrants Get a New Camera. No one knew when they stood on Stanley Hill, each waiting to hold the new family camera. They didn't mind sharing among the 11 of them, one capturing the bridge over the North End, another the city skyline, the old airport. Sadie took candids of Josie scratching her bites, Lena hiking up her sagging skirt, Sam lined up Jean and Phil saluting, Jay making a pig face, Nene showing his new tooth coming in, all of them in costumes they'd found at the dump. It was all about holding the black box for the first time, framing those frozen moments before listening for the lever's click. Frank snapped Rosie singing the Continental while she swished the yellow skirt of her dance hall costume. Little Martha imitating her sister's swing, Nene turning somersaults down the hill. No one knew they couldn't afford film. And my aunt said that, you know, we, we didn't care about the film. We were having fun. It was all about playing and pretending. So that was, that one kind of uh, sets how a lot of those poems are uh, formed. And this one, another major theme in, when I write is about nature. And this one is um, called Raccoon on the Path. And it has a little epigraph at the beginning from Northern Woodlands. Nearly two-thirds of the sensory data a raccoon is processing comes from cells that interpret various types of touch sensation. In other words, touch is as important a sense as hearing, smell, and sight. Raccoon on the path. A toad, small as a pencil eraser, bounces across the path 
like a lost bead. The turtle, halted by our footsteps, closes all doors. Bring out 11 bird songs, find buckeye, bluebird feather, spotted eggshell. One morning, a raccoon, destroyer of our dog's dish, eater of our neighbor's goldfish, thief of tomatoes, break-in artist of garbage, is in the throes of his end. He lies in the narrow part of the path, already his cloudy eyes drifting into what's next. He doesn't drag himself away. He curls his fingers in and out his senses. On the second day, he pulls a sycamore leaf over his face, as though he's covered himself so we can't see his private death. My husband says, don't touch him. We step around him. We step around him on the third day, and again he pulls the leaf over his face and raises his hand, palm toward us like a traffic cop, then curls his fingers in and out. The frogs chur. What gift is compressed in this small wilderness, these last moments? We can't improve the situation. We spread leaves over him. The fourth morning, a dark, wet impression haunts the path. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this poem is called, uh, this is the one I've, I've been asked to read, is Seven Hours on the Road, Con los Exitos. Con los Exitos is, um, it's like the hits. That's, that's what it means in Spanish. It's an album of music from this uh, trio uh, called Los Panchos. And my father is a classically trained guitar player. He would play music all the time when we were growing up um, un until he, he left the, the family when I was uh, 11. This, this poem is for Jimmy Santiago Baca because he's one of my early influences. Immigrants in Our Own Land is a book that meant a lot to me. I still read it today, and it's still as relevant as when he wrote it. And I was having a conversation with myself about are we always going to write this type of work? You know, there's a, a reference uh, to a word that says, sin luz y agua, that's without uh, water and light. Um, I wrote this during Hurricane Maria coming through, and now we had Hurricane Fiona again, and I'm asking my, my family the same questions again. So it's just this constant cycle of, of, of this kind of destruction and creation that's constantly happening um, with these conversations uh, when it comes to, to immigration. And I'll read it in English. I'm not going to read it in Spanish. My Spanish is not that good. I hired someone else to do the Spanish in this book. So, But if um, anyone wants to see it in Spanish, he has some for sale out in the lobby. And, and he has them facing. So you have both languages. So I'll have them side by side. So if you want to learn Spanish, here's a good start. Right? Um, seven hours on the road con los éxitos. One, I understand you. I too soak in the sun and wish the wind would bless me. I feel those rays on those disciplined and erect palm trees. I am one. I stand alone, my brown skin, husky scaled bark, my bilingual tongue spinning in the wind like blades. I was on the road between palm trees. I was almost chewed corn husk thrown into the mud. My father's father planted green and yellow bananas. He would start all over again at the hurricanes. Two. I was one they never captured, still free and greening, spreading words in the wind, mourning how families are imprisoned and separated. Walls mean nothing to me. I don't even feel the anger anymore. They will not take me from who I am. I will remain here selling fruit. I am confused today. I hope your poetry isn't timeless, Jimmy. Did you think you were writing Chicano futurism when you wrote Immigrants in Our Own Land? Did you travel through time to change the year 2020? Were you trying to save me through this page? Your poetry should have never been prophecy. The ones with dreams in their hearts are now called dreamers. The old men still stare. They still think Mexicans are stealing their jobs. We still aren't giving the children a chance to live. I want to give my son a better chance to live. All I have done is survive. Another poet from a barrio 
working through the darkness. Three, there were over a thousand earthquakes in Puerto Rico and no one healed. Juan, Jesus, Gina, and Johanna say, Todo bien, gracias a Dios, sin luz y agua. I am not. Even my songs of survival sound borrowed and out of tune. I listen to oldies on an AM radio station where pastors play interpreters because they know heaven is a foreign land. I am on the road bartering poems for empathy. Some people cry and some people argue after I read those poems. I don't know which is right or wrong to fill about. Four, today it was windy when I drove through the Front Hills towards Moncato Public Library. I passed the Pawnee Village, I passed the Big Blue River, I passed the Little Blue River, and I passed the Republican River. I was afraid of the gusts pushing me sideways. I remembered the sound of Hurricane Fran, how it slowly eroded sentiments of safety. I remembered how quiet the Gokis were that night, how all the palm leaves died in silence, lying on the dirt. I thought about the seashells and their hollowness, how we've mistaken their songs for soft, cool ocean waves and gentle sea breezes, but they are mimicking the howls of windstorms. I remembered when Hurricane Fran landed in the United States and immediately lost all of its forward momentum, becoming a tropical storm and then a tropical depression, returning to the ocean after falling apart, causing loss and devastation as it headed further towards Canada, the only thing keeping it together, a name it never asked for. Five, my friends joked they would move to Canada after the last election. They remained here in Kansas with me. I turned on the AM radio, excuse me, I turned the AM radio off, no longer listening to the COVID-19 news. Elderly dying alone in quarantine around the world. The old feel as alone and isolated here in frontier counties. My abuela died alone in Puerto Rico. I dreamt of her funeral before I was told I didn't get to say goodbye. Now I'm speeding on Highway 36. Social distancing is living as the other. Shelter in place is the life of the undocumented. Racism is this a disease and it's spreading. Six, I turned the CD player on and Willy Colon's El Dia de Mi Suelte is playing. I thought about La Voz, Hector Lavoe, and how the same song can sound so different, but just as sad. I thought about Mark Anthony playing Hector Lavoe in El Cantante. I wish I was dancing to Contra La Corriente with Cochita y Chispa in KC. I looked outside the driver's side window. I was afraid I was lost. There were wind turbines spinning their blades. They were the only signs of progress out here. I was on the road for hours, and I still had a long way to go. Seven. I changed the music, and Los Panchos, quizás, 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 started playing. I sighed, slowed down, and kept driving. El Relo played next, and I sang the only words that I could remember. Thank you. Thank you. And Mary Frances, would you like to read, take us out with the one um, that you wrote about Missouri? All right. And then we can take a few questions if anyone has anything to ask. Okay. Um, when I read this poem at the Capitol uh, afterwards, the, there were all the politicians there because it was a, a political event. And um, several of them came up to me and said, I really understood that poem. I know just what you were talking about. And I said, well then, I succeeded. The breakthrough. <laughs> that is, yeah. Because they, you know, like one of them said, I, I don't ever, I d never thought I liked poetry, but I understood that one. So here it is, Missouri. Little blue trace, still as glass all winter, breaks its silence to eel around its curves. Sunlight spangles the surface like a flash of the minnows. May apples open their umbrellas and shade trillium. 
The hunt is on for morels hidden under elms. A bluebird skims below a heron flapping to its rookery. The chorus frogs cree and trill. I stretch my arms to the cave state, start of the Pony Express, rolling hills and river bluffs, prairie and plateau, earth solid beneath my feet. Summer brings the thump of June bugs on lights, honeybees, and the hornworm emerges as a sphinx moth. By July, we wipe sweat from our necks and bite into sweet corn and catfish, the plumpest big boys and juicy red havens. Pawpaws and persimmons slip from their trees in thuds until katydids cease their churning and chill scatters us like the red and yellow leaves backlit in the last October light. Frost returns to scrim our windows and silence the little blue trace again. We watch snow erase former impressions. By morning, the reverse braille of bird tracks will leave us runic messages. Lovely, and a lot that I, um, that's familiar to me too. Yeah, if you live in Missouri, you know a lot of those things. Sure. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please come up to one or the other microphones so that people um, watching on YouTube will be able to hear what you have to ask. I'm going to step outside because I have got to clear my throat I have, and oh. blow my nose. So. Okay, don't ask Mary Frances anything. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this was actually for both of you anyway. Okay. But thank you so much for being poets because I think it's an act of courage to be a poet in the United States. Um, and the question I have is really process-oriented. I wondered if you have a routine for writing, and if you do, do you have rituals that you do before or after? Thank I you. Don't, I don't have a, a, a process, per se. I mean, I, I write every day, but for me, writing isn't just writing. Writing is also reading. Writing is also editing. I, I see writing as this, as this larger idea um, that, that authors partake in, as someone that edits a lot of work. I, I consider my assistance with that also writing, assisting someone else to write. You know, I don't consider that editing. Um, so writing is something I don't always do with the pen. Sometimes it's with the red marker or the highlighter, you know. The only ritual, ritual I have is, you know, sometimes I, I, I get tangled in a line and I, I walk a lot, like I step away and I walk as long as I need to walk to get back to move to the next portion of it. So it's, it's this ongoing at the desk, removing myself, returning to the desk, it happens quite a bit in my, in my process, especially when, when I get to um, the more concrete pieces of a poem, when the things get a little more finite. That's, that's when that pressure starts to build a little more and I have to go release it. Sir? Uh, several years ago, they had the U.S. Poet Laureate at the library. Uh, he was a Native American and uh, I'm just glad that we're keeping poetry alive. Are and you thinking I, of when Joy Harjo was here? Yeah. Yeah, that was wonderful. Big event. Did you come? I wasn't able to come. Well, to you're a little far out of town, too. Sorry, sir. And uh, I was going to ask you guys if you could do like an 8 or a 16 line poem for the event tonight. But I wanted, I got here late, so I couldn't catch you and give you a little warning, but, <laughs> you know, maybe you can ad lib something for us. Okay, you want a, made, a poem made up right now on the spot? Well, why not? <laughs> I don't know why not. I'm not the poet. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know how you work, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll share a, a poem. It's the first poem I ever had published. You know, it's a, a Cinemally Press, which is, I think, out of Kansas City, if I remember correctly, years ago. It was uh, in a collection okay. called Ascension. That's fine, just in memorandum in the night. Uh, it's called The Obituary Writer, and uh, the poem is, I want to write poems for poets, the kind that don't get published, whispers in a secret tongue only you and I can understand. I want you to love life the way that I love words, as if you're the only living thing left, as if 
You're reading your spouse's obituary, the one that only you can write, that everyone else can feel but barely understand. This is for you. Nice. Very nice. Do you feel like improvising? That wasn't no, improv. No, that's <laughs> not, no. That was not <laughs> no. improv. Yeah, okay. sorry about my allergies, but that's okay, sir. We'll take one more question then, and we'll. Well, good evening, and thanks, guys. And I'm curious, when did people in Kansas start reading books? <laughs> um, <laughs> another question: What is the state of publishing for you guys as poets? How tough is it to get to a publishing house and convince them this is worth doing? And does anybody ever hear anything from David Ray anymore? Um, well, in answer to the question about publishing, uh, it depends on where you send it. Uh, it's very, very hard to get published in what are considered the top tier publishing houses. And you do have to have a substantial uh, reputation, and, um, and it's much harder to get published in, that, in those publishing houses. But if you just want to get a book published, there are lots of places you can send where people are open to looking at um, all kinds of styles and types of poems. And uh, it's just a matter of doing some research and getting out there and um, you know, doing the research to get to those places. You know, some publishing houses uh, publish people's first books, and that's what they want, are beginning writers, and, you know, and some want established writers. So it's a very difficult question to answer simply. And then the other question, David Ray. Yes, I am still in touch with David Ray. He and Judy are now living in um, Arizona. And they are, uh, David's getting up there, but they're both still writing. They still send me a Christmas poem every year. And, um, but I don't think they're probably going to be coming back to Kansas City for a while. Anything to add, Waskar? Not there? Yeah. Okay, well then I thank you both for coming. Um, this has been really wonderful to have you share a stage. And um, as we mentioned earlier, we have their books for sale out in the lobby and they'll be available to sign and chat briefly and uh, they're taking PayPal and cash <coughs> and checks so please uh, anyone go out there and, and talk to them and thank you all for being here.